Our topic for this session is neck trauma. Our first case is a thyroid contusion. There is diffuse enlargement of the entire thyroid gland, and there is an ill-defined region of hypodensity involving the left thyroid lobe and a portion of the isthmus. There is also significant anterior soft tissue swelling. There is the diffuse enlargement of the thyroid. And note again that irregular, ill-defined hypodense region consistent with a contusion. So that is a thyroid contusion resulting from a direct blow. This patient was riding a dirt bike and hit a clothesline. Our next case is a fracture of the laryngeal cartilage. There is a good deal of soft tissue gas in the cervical soft tissues and here in the anterior midline in the laryngeal cartilage there is a linear hypodensity. On bone windows you can see again the soft tissue gas and the rupture of the anterior laryngeal cartilage. There is adjacent ill-defined sclerosis, most likely related to the bending of this cartilage prior to its fracturing. This is obviously an acute injury. There went the hyoid bone and there is the midline defect in the laryngeal cartilage. And on bone windows, this is a relatively unusual injury, the laryngeal cartilage being relatively mobile, usually can sustain a blow without fracturing. This was a karate chop, a direct blow to the anterior larynx. Our next case is a laryngeal laceration. There is a good deal of prevertebral soft tissue gas. And right here at the posterior lateral aspect of the glottis, you can see a defect allowing that gas to escape. Here on the coronal, the location of that defect is more precisely defined. You can see it essentially is in the laryngeal ventricle. The cords on the opposite side are significantly swollen and distorted as well. And there is that defect allowing the gas to exit. And here it is on the coronal. So that was a laryngeal laceration. This was an assault and an attempted choking. So the pressure of that attempted strangulation is what caused this defect. So that is a laryngeal laceration. Our next case is a tracheal laceration. This was a steak knife induced injury. A stabbing with a flat blade such as that can make a defect that is very difficult to spot. Obviously your attention is directed to the airway by this extensive soft tissue gas. The defect itself is difficult to spot again encouraging you to use lung windows and also to always rely on the orthogonal planes as well. Here you can see on the coronal clearly demonstrated are the soft tissue gas and that right lateral tracheal defect obviously shown to advantage in this plane. So there it went on the axial. Again, I encourage you to use lung windows and to view all orthogonal planes 
there it is again shown very nicely on the coronals. So that is a tracheal laceration, a stabbing by a steak knife. Our next case is an esophageal laceration. There is extensive soft tissue gas and obviously whenever an injury of this type is suspected a sip of oral contrast is in order and that's what they did in this particular case and you can see the oral contrast spilling out into the supraclavicular and anterior cervical soft tissues. You can see the culprit here is this metallic foreign body. This was a gunshot wound. And of course, here is more soft tissue gas and oral contrast. The three Ds are somewhat helpful here in that you can see the contrast collection in its entirety and displayed in that su supraclavicular region. And here is the exact location of the bullet which when you rotate the images you're able to appreciate. So here you can see along the tract of that bullet, don't be misled by placing a ruler along the line of the bullet path, I always like to say. But in this case, it's a pretty solid correlation between the extent of the gas, the oral contrast, and the path, presumed path, of that bullet. And here on the 3D, You can appreciate that contrast collection, which looks, of course, very much like bone in that supraclavicular region. So that is an esophageal laceration resulting from a gunshot wound. Our next case, carotid dissections. On this lower cut, you can see a linear filling defect in the proximal right internal carotid artery. Higher up near the skull base, there is no flow at all in that right internal carotid artery. At the level of the carotid canal, you can see that that vessel is empty of contrast and marked contrast to the opposite side. When you peruse the opposite side internal carotid artery, however, you can appreciate a slightly irregular contour and a linear filling defect. This is a common location for traumatic carotid dissections, obviously at the base of the internal carotid above the bifurcation, but also here at the skull base. In the carotid canal on the left, you can appreciate incomplete filling of that vessel, the semilunar hypodensity consistent with a dissection. So here is the semi view of that right internal carotid dissection. There is slight involvement of the external as well. But you can see from this point up, there is no flow whatsoever in the right internal carotid. Let's transfer our attention to the left. You can see the irregular linear filling defect and the incomplete filling of the carotid canal. There is the linear filling defect, irregular contour, and again, incomplete filling of the vessel within the carotid canal. Obviously at the highest level here you can see the right internal carotid continues to not fill and there is ultimately collateral reconstitution of the right intracranial vessels. So this was a motor vehicle collision resulting in a bilateral carotid artery dissection. 
Our next case is a vertebral artery laceration. You can see there is a metallic foreign body that actually was an archery mishap. So that is a, an arrow. There is adjacent soft tissue gas. And most importantly, there is no contrast enhancement of the right vertebral artery. Here is the offending arrow. They were wise enough not to remove the arrow completely, but its presence partially within the soft tissues right there actually is misleading because it suggests to the viewer that that arrow did not penetrate as deeply as it actually did. So you can follow that right vertebral artery and see you lose it quite quickly. And on the three-dimensional, you can appreciate it as well. You can see the left vertebral artery is in view there. And then when we go around to the affected side, if you look between the transverse processes there, you cannot appreciate the vertebral artery. Let's look at that again. You can see it on the left. Coming around to the affected right side, you cannot find the vertebral artery running through the transverse process foramina. So the presence of that arrow in that particular position is again misleading. The arrow actually drove all the way in to strike the vertebral artery and the vertebral column and then was partially retracted. So while it caused no major vessel damage, it did slip through here and cause that specific vertebral artery dissection. Our last case is a carotid artery, jugular venous fistula, resulting from a gunshot wound. There is early jugular venous return. Compare that to the opposite side. It is a sure indicator that there is an arteriovenous fistula present. You can see that fistula here, where there's a communication between a carotid pseudoaneurysm and the adjacent jugular vein. There is an adjacent lobe of this carotid pseudoaneurysm, making that actually a bilobed pseudoaneurysm. And mo more posteriorly, you can see the damage to the vertebral column and the absent right vertebral artery contrast column. And here is the offending bullet trapped beneath the skin in the posterior cervical soft tissues. Note again that early venous return, there the communication between the carotid and the jugular. Second lobe of that bilobed pseudoaneurysm is visible there. And let's note that vertebral artery contrast column, which we lose right there. On the coronals, you can appreciate again the early jugular venous return, one of the lobes of that carotid pseudoaneurysm, and its second lobe more posteriorly. And here the vertebral artery contrast column ends. And here we see the defect left by that bullet in the right lamina, the mid cervical spine. And there again, the offending bullet. Note the early jugular return, the carotid pseudoaneurysm, the vertebral artery column, and lastly, posteriorly, the offending bullet. There you see the laminar defect. Three Ds do help you appreciate the early jugular return, the communication between the carotid and the jugular, and posteriorly, the second lobe of that carotid pseudoaneurysm. Lastly, there is the position of the bullet posteriorly. There is the bullet. And here you see nicely the pseudoaneurysms arising from the carotid and that communication between it and the jugular 
resulting in the early jugular venous return. So that is a case of carotid jugular fistula formation with carotid pseudoaneurysm and vertebral artery laceration and occlusion. And that concludes this session on neck trauma.